Uh, I will soon hand over to Dr. Donelson, who will introduce the speaker today, and then we have the ceremony delivering the medal to Gabriela after the speech. So, I will hand over to him. Thank you very much. It's a great honor for me to introduce this year's uh, Klein lecture, but first I would like to say a few words about uh, Oscar Klein and the background. <laughs> <laughs> it still works anyway. About the background of this series of, of lectures, after all it's in honor of Oscar Klein that you are here today. So Oscar Klein is certainly one of the, or the most famous theoretical physicists. Swedish theoretical physicist, and he was born in 1894 and was a professor here in Stockholm between the years of 1930 and 1962. And he had great interest in many different areas of, of, of physics and with connections with uh, other physicists and scientists from all over the world. And if you, after the lecture, look at the, the board on the side here outside, you can see the signatures of many different scientists that had visited Klein here in Stockholm scientists like Heisenberg, Bohr, Lisa Meitner, and, and many others. Now, among the contributions from Klein to physics, uh, you can mention several different things which are still very much in use, such as the Klein-Gordon equation that describes scalar particles and their interactions, the Klein-Nishina equation that describes the scattering of light of electrons, and we also have the so-called Kalusa-Klein theories. Klein was very much ahead of his time in thinking about important subjects in physics that still occupies our, our, we still occupy ourselves with today. He was speculating about the existence, the possible existence of extra dimensions and whether they could be used to unify gravity and electromagnetism into one, one big framework. And these ideas play a crucial role in, in modern physics. And uh, those of you who are here have been also uh, taking part in the, in the conference on cosmology and string theory here in Stockholm this week. You've heard the name Klein mentioned several times during the, during the conference. Now, in order to uh, honor Oscar Klein, this series of, of lectures was uh, starting in 1988, and I will here give you the list of the people who have been giving these lectures during the, the past years. And as you see from the list here, it's a quite a prestigious people who have been, been coming here. And you can count up to, I think, six Nobel laureates, of which, interesting enough, two of them, Tuft and Gross, did not have their Nobel Prize before coming here. And I can, I think it's a good guess to say that this is a lower limit among the people on these lists here. Okay, now as you see here, the uh, Oscar Klein lecture of this year is uh, Professor Gabriele Veneziano, who is of course well known for everyone working in string theory and I'm sure in other other subjects of theoretical physics and physics in general as well. And uh, Professor Veneziano is uh, currently at the uh, Collège de France and he is uh, born 65 years ago in Florence in Italy and has been at many different places during his career. He got his PhD at Weizmann Institute with uh, Hector Rubinstein as an advisor and Hector is here in the, in the audience. And he moved on with, to a postdoc at MIT, and back to Weizmann Institute, and has also been at CERN at the Theory Division, and as I mentioned, he's a professor at Collège de France at the moment. Now, Gabriele has been uh, named, or well, mentioned as being the father of string theory, which I guess makes Hector, the grandfather of string theory, I guess. <laughs> and uh, this all goes back to the end of the 60s, when uh, Gabriele discovered uh, that a certain mathematical formula, the function, rather the Euler beta function, could be used to describe properties of the strong nuclear force. Uh, quite a remarkable discovery, which also led to 
attempts to use strings, because it turned out that it was really strings it was behind these equations, strings could be used maybe as a theory for the strong interactions. Well, then it turned out that string theory was really much more than that. And in the middle of the 70s, it was discovered the string theory most probably is a theory of quantum gravity, a theory of everything. And then, since then, Gabriele has continued to work and contribute to string theory, most notable to the subject of string cosmology, which certainly is one of the most hot subjects within, within current string theory, and I would say even modern physics, modern theoretical physics in general. Now, even though I have listed all of these glorious achievements here, this is not quite enough in order for Gabriele to receive the Klein Medal. There's something else which is needed as well, and that is that Gabriele successfully delivered today's lecture. Please. <laughs> for the very nice words. Uh, well, I would like to address now uh, distinguished members of the Swedish Royal Academy of Science, members of the Oscar Klein family, yeah, here, uh, colleagues, friends, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's for me a great honor and pleasure to give this year's Oscar Klein uh, Memorial Lecture, and thus to play tribute to a brilliant Swedish physicist to his great achievements and particularly to his amazing foresight in physics. As I hope it will emerge from my talk, the basic ideas of what became known as Kaluza Klein theory, as Ulf reminded us, are still playing, and this after some eight years, a central role in today's theoretical physics, and in particular in string theory and in cosmology which was, by the way, the subject of this of the conference that is going on right now. Now, in order to illustrate better this point, I decided, after a little education, to give today a very basic and elementary introduction to what string theory is, to how it may, it may solve some of today's outstanding problems in theoretical physics, to some of its fascinating properties, but also to the great challenges that it is still presenting in front of us. Now, I apologize in advance for the experts, to the experts for being too elementary and to the possible non-experts for not being elementary enough. So, I hope to have found some sort of balance so that every one of you will be able to go home with something. I hope I certainly will. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so in the way of introduction, let me say that at the turn of the 19th century, therefore about 100 years ago, two revolutions had just taken the shape of them, two sacred scientific beliefs at the time. One was the belief in absolute determinism which was shaken when Max Planck, in 1900, puzzled by some ultraviolet divergence in the black body spectrum, introduced the constant H and started the quantum revolution, the time constant. And second, the belief in absolute time, when Albert Einstein, in 1905, building on the experimental fact that the speed of light in vacuum is C, which is science, and finite, arrived in a special theory of relativity. Now, uh, 10 years later, Einstein set off yet another revolution. Starting from the Galilean University of Tripoli, he arrived at the geometric formulation of gravity, general relativity, in which even the concept of absolute Euclidean the time geometry was abandoned. And in this framework, general relativity, Newton's constant plays 
important role because it fixes the amount, the overall amount of space and or time curvature which is in use in the, on the geometry by the presence of mass and energy. So just to summarize the three constants A, C and G are responsible for no absolute determinism, no absolute time, and no absolute geometry. Now, in the later part of his scientific life, Einstein tried to combine in a single conceptual framework all these fantastic developments. In particular, he tried to unify gravity and electromagnetism, but we know that neither Einstein's nor others succeeded. But let me immediately point out, and this was also reminded of a moment ago, that today you can certainly say that the most serious attempt to get directions were indeed those initiated by Kaluta and Fein, any case in the following, in the 20s. And uh, I remind you that according to their theory, pure gravity in the presence of one compact extra dimension Space, which is there is one extra dimension of space, the fourth dimension of space, a little circle of radius r, such a theory of just gravity gives automatically rise to a unified theory of gravity and electromagnetism when seen at distances which are much bigger than space. Furthermore, and this is one of the most amazing results of that theory, electric charge is automatically quantized in units which are proportional to one over r. I mean, basically speaking, the fine factor constant is proportional to the, uh, the Planck length squared by the r squared. I will come back to this Planck length in a moment, but just to say that the dimensions of this uh, extra dimension of space, the size of this extra dimension of space, must be very, very small. Now, Einstein very much appreciated the potentialities of this kaluza klein idea, but he got frustrated, at least this is my own reading of some of the papers, by his own unsuccessful attempts around the 40, 1940 or so, to exorcise it from its essential quantum aspect. It's an essential quantum aspect in kaluza klein theory that somehow uh, Einstein didn't quite like. And in fact, as you know, uh, Einstein in his later part of his life struggled very much with quantum mechanics and he even said uh, a year before his death that I, I must seem like an old kid who buried his head in the relativistic sense in order not to say the same quantum. And so the subject of this talk today is basically what has become of this Einstein's unification dream and of the Kaluza Klein idea some 50 years later. Now, if you think it over, uh, Einstein's dream was to unify our theoretical understanding of the quantum world, which describes the infinitely small, quote unquote, with the classical world of the infinitely large. But more quantitatively, what do physicists mean by this infinity? You know that physicists don't like infinity, so they must be tested by some finite. Now, if you think that the uh, shortest conceivable classical length in the theory, you come up with this famous length introduced by Planck. A combination of those three constants I had at the beginning gives rise to this length, which is very, very tiny, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, or the non expert 0 followed by 33 zeros one. And an associated time, which is extremely short, 10 to the minus 14 seconds. Whereas the maximal explorable length scale in the universe is basically the one given by the Hubble law, which is the redshift of, of the wavelength as a function of the distance of the source from us. That, that scale, so-called Hubble length, is 10 to the 28 centimeters, a graph that corresponds to how far away we can look in the universe, and the associated time scale uh, is 10 to the 18 seconds, which is roughly the age of the universe. Now, the ratio of these two scales is not infinite, of 
Force is a finite number, but the logarithmic thing that 10 to the 60 and 10 to the 61 is a pretty good approximation to infinity. Now, to cope with this huge hierarchy of scales and describe how you may be able to, be, to, to, to deal with physics at so tremendously different uh, length scales, I will use a tool which I borrowed from the Russian uh, school. In fact, it's something that Lev Landau introduced more or less as a joke uh, in the 30s, and it has been followed up in particular Lev Okun has used it very much in his own presentation sometimes. What do you do in this? This is a cube of theories. So we will be doing for a little while some kind of exercise in in the theory of theories, okay, meta theory, let's say. Uh, the cube simply has three axes, okay, cube. One axis is characterized by quantum constant, one is the inverse of the speed of light, and the third by the Newton constant. So the more you go along this axis, the more quantum you become, the more you go along this axis, the more relativistic you become, and here we feel the gravitational force. And now we'll start a little guided tour around this cube to illustrate various types of, of, of physical systems. Now, I start with the so-called trivial vertex of the cube, where you can neglect quantum mechanics, relativity, and even the force of gravity. You use the famous second law of Newton, F is MA, F is zero, so A is zero, and you get a linear uniform motion and constant velocity. Let's uh, move on the cube along an edge from 1 to 2. That means that we can uh, turn on gravity, but we still neglect relativity and quantum mechanics. The typical system which lies along this edge is the solar system. It's very well described by Newtonian gravity, where it's Newton's law, and you can neglect to a very good approximation but that is the easy correction, and certainly uh, to a very, very good approximation of the quantum Now you can continue our little tour by going along this axis. Here you find that uh, special relativity is important, but not quantum mechanics and gravity. So for instance, if you look at the motion of a particle accelerated in an accelerator ring before it it hits any other uh, particle, then uh, will certainly satisfy the laws of uh, special relativity, the famous E equal mc square of Einstein, so the energy as a function of the velocity is given by special relativity. And just to finish our most major trick, part of the trick, if we move along this axis, it means we want to describe systems in which Gravity is inessential, relativity is also inessential, but quantum mechanics is very relevant. And here the typical system is atomic physics, for instance, the hydrogen atom. And of course, it's very important to uh, take into account the uncertainty principle. Again, here uh, <coughs> it's not true that relativistic effects are completely negligible, but the good approximation uh, they are, and gravity, on the other hand, is completely. Now, it is more interesting when we start to move not along these edges of the cube, but rather uh, along uh, faces of the cube. And the most relevant ones are those connected again with the trivial vertex we started. Uh, for instance, along uh, this phase, 1, 2, 5, 3, we have systems in which now uh, we can neglect quantum mechanics, but we cannot neglect either gravity or relativity. And uh, this is the uh, domain in which general relativity acts. Okay. General relativity, which tells us, as I said in the beginning, that matter, represented by the right hand side of the Einstein equation, curves space time. And this is the curve of the space time. Now, uh, this is the sarcastic uh, achievement of Einstein in 1915. His achievement was indeed to put together gravity and special relativity into uh, what is known as general relativity. In general relativity, the synthesis of Newtonian gravity and special relativity has become, by all means, our 
standard model of classical gravity, connection to Newtonian gravity have been tested better and better over the years, to the level now of Fermi's decisions. But actually, special uh, general relativity not only provides some testable corrections to Newtonian gravity, but also provides new, intrinsically new phenomena, like the existence of black holes, for which there is overwhelming evidence, and the existence of gravitational waves, for which there is indirect in the, in the evidence and searches are being made. In order not to uh, save, in order to save <coughs> time, uh, you know, I will go quickly over some pictures. Uh, in the center of our galaxy, uh, is believed to be a huge black hole of more than one million solar masses. So there is a lot of experimental evidence for black holes even in our own galaxy. This is uh, an old thing of curve of how the binary system 1913 and 1916 uh, changes its period. So the, the shift in the heavy axon time of this binary system shows this uh, decree, which uh, uh, is interpreted in general relativity as due to the emission of gravitational waves. And you see the perfect agreement between the curve predicted by the general relativity and the data. And by now, of course, this continues and, uh, and the agreement is still being uh, spectacular. And there was, of course, a Nobel Prize. And this is, uh, these are some of the existing apparatuses to try to look for a direct detection of gravitational waves in the space, vehicle collaboration, and there are also uh, cryogenic antennas, and there is a project to put an interferometer in space for life. But let me not have too much time. Now, let's go back to our cube a little while. So, we already explored this space. Now, let's move to this other one, 1364. That's where we can neglect gravity, but relativity and quantum mechanics are both crucial. Now, this is precisely where uh, quantum field theory comes into place. Uh, if it's symbolized here by Dirac's equation. And like with general relativity, we get here from the synthesis now of special relativity and quantum mechanics something which works amazingly well. The synthesis of these two uh, pillars gives quantum field theory and in particular the celebrated standard model of elementary particles, which is verified to very high precision, for instance, at the experiments that have left the CERN. Now, uh, I want to emphasize that the quantum and relativity nature of the standard model is absolutely crucial. It manifests itself to real and virtual particle production. Why real? Real because in, in relativity you can convert energy into mass and mass into energy. And virtual because of quantum mechanics these processes can even violate energy conservation for a very short period of time. Now, taking this effect into account is absolutely essential for the agreement between this theory and the experimental data. This is a sketch of the present uh, situation. I think, uh, two years ago, even it was less already out of uh, working. Uh, and it shows that uh, many, many observables fit very well with the standard model physics. Uh, there is only one missing element of the standard model, which has not been detected yet, but this is why uh, the new accelerator, LFT, that has a device of CERN, will be hunting for this missing uh, brick of the standard model for this photos, but of course the hope is that uh, LHC will bring much more than just uh, this part. Uh, I will skip very briefly <coughs> this couple of transfers. You can ask me what about phase one, two, three, four. I usually don't talk about it. I thought that there were no interesting systems in which you 
a quantum mechanics in gravity and no relativity, but actually uh, there is a possibility of uh, for gravitationally bound quantum state. And uh, uh, if you have a guess, you can go back to that later. So let me summarize so far. What we said is that Newtonian <coughs> gravity plus special relativity provides a standard model of classical gravity known as general relativity, while then special relativity combined with quantum mechanics provides a standard model of elementary particles. And both work wonders. I mean, there is no crisis, no observable deviation so far from the predictions of either theory. But again, the question arises of how we combine all three. This is the classical theory, mm -hmm. this is the quantum mechanical theory. Can we really combine now, the issue is not just a conceptual or aesthetical one. It becomes physically very relevant if we look at the at problems in cosmology. My claim is that, the, that cosmology, especially if you look at all the uh, time evolution of the universe, occupies the whole interior of our cube. In the interior of our cube, nothing can be neglected, neither gravity nor relativity or quantum mechanics, and therefore cosmology calls for a grand synthesis of all these uh, three bricks. Uh, now, and the reason is quite simple. Uh, it has to do a lot with the expansion of the universe. Since we know that the universe is expanding today, if we take back the past, we know that it must have been very hot and dense in the past. Now, a very hot universe means very high energy. In which relativity, therefore, is very important. A very dense universe means high curvature through the Einstein equation. And having high curvature, you can also uh, predict that there are quantum processes, processes taking place in this very firm space time. And this, by the way, we believe to be one of the mechanisms to produce the structure that we observe in the universe. And finally, the fact that the speed of light is finite means that to look far in space is like looking very much back in time, and this establishes a deep connection between those two enormously different scales, the Hubble radius very far in space, and the, uh, the plant time after the Big Bang, which means looking back uh, very much back in time to the very beginning of the universe. So what I'm saying is that the more we go towards the past in the universe, the more we approach this uh, vertex A, which is of course the most difficult one to deal with, because that's where we have to combine the normal gravity, special relativity, and quantum mechanics. What we have seen so far is that we know how to add these two, we know how to add those two, but it's not, it's not like adding numbers, you can just uh, use some uh, uh, associative, associativity and get the sum of the three just as simply as that. So, what is the result of trying to combine them? And this is where we face problems, and the problems uh, have to do somehow with pathologies of general relativity, both at the classical and at the quantum level. Now, I told you that general relativity, of course, works very well if you look at uh, large distance phenomena, uh, you know, like the solar system or the like galaxy, the cosmology itself. But it has a little tip. Namely, there are uh, general results, due to Hoffman and Penrose in particular, which imply that under quite general conditions, even if you go give perfectly smooth initial data, those lead by evolution to space-time singularities. Now, when I say initial data that lead to space-time singularity, it looks like it can only give singularities in the future, but because of time reversal invariant, you can also say that present data gives singularity in the past, like the big bang singularity. Now, the problem is that near curvature, in, now these singularities mean uh, uh, instance in time or 
locations in space where something blows up and becomes infinitely big. And of course, we physicists don't like this. Now, fortunately, you would say, near this curvature singularity, the infinitely dense regions or infinitely hot regions, quantum convection, general relativity, cannot be neglected. This you can argue on very solid generality. So, the question comes very naturally, can quantum mechanics remove the singularities of general relativity like it did with uh, other infinities a century ago? After all, the hydrogen atom classically is stable and, uh, and, and uh, quantum mechanics managed to solve that problem in a very simple way. However, here, it seems that quantum mechanics uh, even worse than this. Improving. It seems to work in the situation and to make things uh, have infinities or singularities, even if you talk about physics being away from singularities. The reason uh, is a little bit technical, but I'll try to uh, illustrate it. So, uh, if, you, if you look at the a process in which an electron emits a photon and reabsorbs it because of the uncertainty principle, it can do that even by awaiting energy conservation, providing it does it for the rest of time. That process leads to calculable corrections to the theory in which you neglect this approach. And those are precisely those corrections, those quantum corrections, which I told you are not only there, but they are really needed for agreement between the theory and the experiment. If you consider the same process, but where the same electron emits a graviton, which is the quantum of gravity, like the quantum of the quantum of electromagnetism, then uh, this process leads to uncalculable uh, corrections, to infinities that you are not really able to deal with. This has to do with the fact the higher the energy, the higher is the uh, gravitational coupling because the gravity coupling feels the energy of, uh, of, the, of the system. Now, to be sure, there are uh, infinities also in quantum field, but the difference is that you can see them and keep some predictive. Actually, this, uh, let me open a short parenthesis, if we follow the Kaluza Klein idea and increase the number of spatial dimensions, then quantum field theories start having the same bad ultraviolet problem that quantum gravity has in four D four dimensional space time. This of course is not all unexpected because of the unification of the intrinsic Kaluza Klein theory. Now, so how does one tame these infinities, say, in the standard model. And it's a very instructive example of this taming is given by comparing the weak interaction in Fermi's theory and in the standard model, which will now to be decorated with weak interaction. So let's try to compare a uh, neutron decay, it has decay in the 1934's Fermi theory and in the electro weak theory of Plasso, Salon, and Weinberg. Uh, in the old Fermi theory, a neutron disintegrates into a proton, electron, and neutrino, and everything happens in a single point in space and time. Now, in the new picture, besides the fact that this is not the central point here, that the neutron and the proton are seen as components. Quarks. The quarks themselves do not emit the electron and the neutrino at a single point in a single instant of time. There is a radiator, so called double boson, which travels a tiny distance for a tiny amount of time. But you know, this emission vertex and this other emission vertex are really a little bit separated in space and time. So the interaction which in Fermi theory happens at a single point in space time, here it's near over a finite region of space and time. So
So as a result of this theory, electroweak theory has infinities and therefore has also uncalculable parameters. You cannot just calculate everything of nothing. You have to measure it, these things. But it retains a lot of predictivity, unlike Fermi's theory. Now, the question is, is it possible to do something similar in general relativity? A priori, this mirroring of the gravitational interactions looks something very, uh, very much at odds with the general principle of general relativity, which is based on a space time continuum in which you, it's very essential to be able to define coincidences of events. But, and here now I will come to string theory. String theory seems capable of realizing that dream, and it does so, somewhat paradoxical perhaps, but through quantum mechanics, through what we may call some quantum string magic. Now, let me spend a few transparencies trying to explain for the non experts, of course, uh, what is string theory. Uh, but what is string theory? Somebody, I think, very likely said, well, string theory with, with capital S and T is the theory of strings, lower case S. <laughs> this looks uh, a bit uh, of a joke, but I think it's, it's quite deep. It says that somehow we should replace some ground principles like the equivalence principle of general the gauge principle that governs the standard model by just, and of course this just is a big just. The assumption that everything is made of relativistic quantum strings. So the idea is that if, uh, if you combine the idea that everything is, is made by some one dimensional objects called strings, by, and you add to this statement the fact that you want to satisfy special relativity and quantum mechanics, then you get a magic three ingredient cocktail, you shake it well, and there comes the grand synthesis, which appears to solve the, uh, the problems that otherwise we are facing. And let me try to illustrate this through a couple of uh, examples. I think there are two main uh, magic quantum properties of strings. The first is the following. Uh, if you take, so they have to do with comparing what happens in strings if you describe them classically and if you describe them according to quantum mechanics. So if you have a classical relativistic string, the string is characterized by a tension, which tells you how much energy is stored in the same length. Uh, then uh, a classical string may have any size L and therefore any mass, T times L. But quantum strings, because of the uncertainty principle, uh, have a minimal or rather an optimal size, which is called the string length, which, and, you know, you have just to think about the ball radius of an atom or the size of a quantum harmonic oscillator, it's very similar. And this fundamental length that the theory has is given by the string tension and by the quantum, so it's explicit the quantum mechanical strength. And this length I mean, is introduced in very natural way when you look at the quantum action of a string, it's just you want to uh, divide the area squared by the string in order to make these uh, dimensions. That means that uh, a, a process in which, for instance, uh, they were throwing in the neutron decay in which two particles come to a single point and then split off another one, uh, has to be seen in string theory as something which is indeed smeared over a region of space time which is characterized by this uh, fundamental quantum length of the string. So, for instance, the scattering process in general takes place like this, which is uh, something which I hope you can imagine yourself from this poor picture. Now, there is a second, perhaps as important, uh, miracle, quantum miracle, which is the following. Again, if you take classical things, they cannot have angular momentum without having also a finite size. I mean, it's a classical object, how can you have angular momentum? 
on the side which has no spatial uh, side. So, but if it has this uh, finite size, it must have a finite mass. So, no uh, <coughs> classical strings with angular momentum and no mass. But quantum strings may have up to two units of angular momentum, units of each bar, of course, without acquiring the mass. In other words, the classical inequality between the mass of the string and its angular momentum is gets corrected <coughs> in quantum level by a term which of course is a Fisher symphony, and we have only one consistent way of regularizing the symphony sum, and that is a negative. So that to this equation you can have n equal to zero while having j equal alpha naught h bar, where alpha naught can be zero, one half, one, three half, or two. So we get precisely these five possibilities of masters spinning particles in the theory. Now why is this very important? Well, first of all, this is showing again the same thing that is stupid. So this is very important because of course we know that the master spin one particle uh, has the same quantum numbers as the photon and negate uh, electromagnetic interaction and uh, similar objects can negate the other interactions of the standard model why a zero mass spin two particle associated with the graviton which negates the gravitational interactions. In other words, integer Ma integer spin massless states, but let me emphasize integer but not spin massless states, are our favorite carriers of interactions, of the non gravitational interactions, and of gravity flows, while the half integer massless states could play very well the role of the constituents of master, leptons, quarks, and so So the fact that there is a common string origin for the photon and the graviton, is what implies a quantitative unification of all forces very my energy. Now, the string length parameter which I was discussing a moment ago is this, uh, is controlling this high energy scale. In fact, it can be converted to an energy scale by, uh, again, the uncertainty principle. And that these energies, gravitational and electromagnetic interactions, become compromised. In turn, this implies some relation between the string length and the Planck length. We roughly put the string length uh, uh, in order of magnitude higher than the Planck length, or the minus length, mm -hmm. or the energy <coughs> at which we get unification around the huge value of energy. GV. Notice that this is very reminiscent of the Luther Klein unification of electromagnetism and gravity and the energy scale which corresponds to the Kaluza Klein compartification radius. Very, very big similarity, consider it even more. So if we combine the two miracles, the finite size for the string and massless spinning particles, then it's clear that we can get a unified and finite theory of elementary particles and of their gauge and gravitational interaction, which is just not compatible with quantum mechanics, but is really based in a very uh, essential way of quantum mechanics. So we could answer to Mr. Einstein that the realistic sense and the energy quanta had to coexist. Now, there is more quantum magic, and this is only a partial list, but I want to emphasize uh, at least uh, these two points. Again, the contrast between classical and quantum strings is that classical string can move consistently in any ambient space-time, but quantum strings require particular space-times in which they can move in order to avoid some anomalies which would kill the theory. And in fact, uh, string theory predicts that states must have more space dimensions than the ones we observe, typically nine more, fortunately only a single time. 
And uh, that being the case, some 50 years later, well, I think 50 years later, because this was discovered in the 70s, which means correct information, uh, vindicates the Kaluska Kavan idea. Now, six of them must be compact and small, otherwise, to be see them. But how small? Okay. Well, here there is a, a symmetry, that's another <laughs> quantum miracle of the theory. Uh, uh, there is a symmetry called key duality, which tells us that uh, considering a compactification radius r or a compactification radius <coughs> L string squared divided by r gives an equivalent theory. So string theory provides a minimal value for the Kaluza Klein radius, which is rich and effective minimal Kaluza Klein radius, which is when these two quantities are the same, which means when the compatibility radius is actually identified with the string length. Therefore, now you see the string unification and Kaluza Klein unification may become just one the same. Now, it's very interesting, by the way, that when you reach this particular value of the radius, there is a string diversion of the Kaluza Klein mechanism which produces not only electromagnetism, but also non abelian gauge theories, the ones that are needed for the standard model. And finally, I think I am also to emphasize this, which is, unfortunately, it's not the best. Uh, <coughs> point about the theory is that there, well, on one hand it's very nice, there are no free parameters in the, in the string theory, there is nothing like, I would say, unpredictable thing, but um, they are replaced by a field. This J equals zero field, scalar field, described by the way by the current model of equation, whose value provides dynamically the both constants of nature. Now, but which dynamics fixes the values of these fields? This is a very, very important and open problem. In fact, at the so-called perturbative level, these fields are masses, which means their value is unconstrained. We don't know it's a free parameter. And uh, if these particles, uh, which also means that these fields are mass, then if they, if, uh, if they remain, remain light, even after the theory is completely solved, which is far from being the case, then they may induce short distance modifications of gravity, space-time variations of this above constant, which are all threats to the theory, and threaten even the equivalent of the universal people, which are all things which are very well tested. So, on one hand, this is a very active field of experimental and theoretical research. I mean, to find even small effects of this type would be would very much go into, uh, into confirming the theory. On the other hand, I think it shows that, contrary to what some people claim, that string theory is intrinsically falsifiable. I mean, it's just that we don't know today how to compute the mass of the state of particles. Of course, we could one day, and we could really decide that the Dillaton is a zero mass, a discoupling, then we could just also try to theory immediately. What is this tube of theories becoming in string theory, therefore? Well, I like to think it this way, that actually for quantum mechanics and relativity, you only need uh, the speed of light, and I like to think that you only need the length parameter, the string length, but it depends really on the units you use. So there is an axis for relativity, there is an axis for quantum mechanics still. But then the third axis, instead of putting the Newton constants, which now you have unification of everything, uh, it's really this uh, scalar field of this module as we call them, which determine all the dimensionless parameters of the field. And the question which we are not able to answer today is whether they are fixed, whether they are free, and if they are free, whether they are discrete or continuous parameters. And as I said, some level of approximation, some are dangerously free. If uh, that is the case, if they can 
really there is then there is another absolute thing which falls down, which is uh, that even microphysics is not absolute. You know, we said no absolute time, no absolute determinism, no absolute geometry, but still general relativity, the equivalent principle says that no three falls in distance, microphysics is the same. Well, that could not be the case. However, these are difficult questions which are really being in today's this year. Well, I think time is getting a bit short. I have just uh, a couple of points to make. One is that you know, possible physical applications to black hole physics. Uh, let me go quickly over those. Uh, there have been quite an impressive problem uh, in film theory in understanding the thermodynamics of black holes, in particular of uh, having a statistical mechanic interpretation of the famous Hawking Bekenstein formula for the energy of the black hole. Uh, partly as a result, I think, and uh, also about the spin development, Hawking has taken care of some explains that uh, uh, the for quantum coherence is lost when the black hole is formed, so there seems to be no flash. And in cosmology, well, in cosmology, the big open question is what happens to those singularities that we can remember we were mentioning, saying that perhaps quantum mechanics can help solve the uh, classical singularities of general relativity. Unfortunately, we don't yet know the full answer to that question. We know that string theory results certain singularities, the uh, time-like singularities, suppose, but those associated with the cosmology, the Big Bang singularity, or the singularity of the interior of the black hole, are harder to deal with. Very likely, they are also eliminated or will be reinterpreted in string theory. In other words, we may need new degrees of freedom or a non-singular description of what happens uh, in the Big Bang. And if indeed we, if this would be the case, we can conceive new cosmological scenarios in which the Big Bang is no longer the beginning of time, but is the result of a previous space during which uh, the space-time curvature, or say the Hubble parameter, the Einstein parameter is due until a, a maximal value would be again given by the slim length. And perhaps at the same time, the x elements have to spin down to the well defined value, which again may be used as a metric to sell it to value. Um, and then, after uh, rising to this uh, high spin values, the 10 hertz rule will be very high, uh, the spin phase is follow and it makes the universe bound. Therefore, the Big Bang in these kinds of scenarios becomes a big bounce. Now, uh, these scenarios may provide new solutions to the problems of standard cosmology, an older universe rather than a smaller one uh, of the equation parity, or perhaps would only be a way to generate initial conditions of the convection equation that we need. usually show some wine glasses illustrating conventional cosmology, conventional cosmology in which the observable universe today was too big uh, right after the Big Bang relative to the, uh, the, the, the size of uh, causal uh, connection. Uh, the universe just started the Big Bang. Inflation changes and make the initial universe small enough that it can become homogeneous, and in this pre Big Bang scenario, you may even have a easier life because you have a longer time in your past. And uh, these cosmologies have uh, observable consequences, can be tested in principle. For instance, let me just mention the possibility of uh, producing in this. Uh, Growing curvature phase is stochastic vector with gravitational weights. Um, people have been 
searching for those, and for instance, I, I heard from a collaborator that, that LIGO, this interferon method of the state, is now put in an upper bound on the stochastic test and transitional weight, which is already quite close to the green line, which is the bound that has to be satisfied anyway in order not to spoil all the synthesis. Uh, so, is that we have found versions of LIGO and or VIRCO and they go into the region where you may expect to see something in the future. So, let me come to the conclusion. I think it's good enough for your time. It seems to me that Einstein's unification dream is realized in string theory, at least at the theoretical level, but certainly in a way that we could uh, hardly imagine. In fact, with inside, we can say that string theory uh, was born in the late 60s, actually through a very bottom-up approach of uh, started with a collaboration with the model, Ekron Rubik and Pirasor and myself. I have to take this opportunity to really thank Ekron for having provided me with a wonderful atmosphere. And, uh, and uh, you know, a posteriori, you can say that it, it was discovered because there do exist strings in the Adronic world, thanks to the confinement of quarks. In fact, we go to that today, talk about the PCB string thing. Now, that Adronic string theory is still awaiting to be discovered. We don't yet know what is the right. A string theory for QCD, although now it has become a very, very best of the subject again. And the original one, the original string theory, has found a possible application of quantum gravity that no one could actually foresee at the time. So clearly, Einstein could not have imagined all this roundabout way to get to a theory of quantum gravity. In fact, I like to quote the words by either Amati or Pugini or both, I tried to check to Daniel Amati. He was unable to tell me if it was his invention or serving or the truth is I put both and said, this looks like a piece of 24th century physics that felt to have the mass, but now we are in sections. It's not too early now to, to do something about it. So the dream is realized, Einstein's dream, thanks to and not against quantum mechanics. In fact, without quantum mechanics, I emphasize once more, strings do not provide any photons, any gravity. Therefore, no long range electromagnetic uh, potentials, forces, and gravitational fields. And this only emerged as semi classical limits of the fundamental quantum theory of extended objects. I think this is a very important point. Um, how really uh, the general relativity concepts may emerge only in some approximations to the theory. And as I said, Einstein's dreams come true, but in a way which is quite opposite to the one he was pursuing. In fact, it is more like an improvement of the Lutheran theory, while, you know, while Einstein seems to me was trying to take the quantum out of Kaluza Klein theory, string does the opposite. You know, it, it's even more quantum. The roots of reality is immediately quantum. Uh, now, I don't know how you would have reacted to string theory. Perhaps like it did to quantum mechanics when you said, God doesn't play with dice. You may have said, God doesn't play strings. <laughs> or maybe you would have accepted that he can play dice. <laughs> but so far during the last 50 years there have been ever mounting evidence for instance with Ekron that he does play that. So I don't know. Uh, we could be disappointed once more. I mean as I emphasized there are this masters skin zero particles which I don't quite like. And I remind you one of the reasons why the old Adronic string died was because it insisted on giving us massless particles and strong interactions along the short range. 
will massless particles be again the killer? And the other question I have in mind is, does in theory really apply to the particles? Other layers of compositeness we know before we can really apply. So, but even then, even if maybe it will not apply to uh, our present known theories, I think that uh, it's too beautiful not to have a place in nature. And let me quote to finish again other kinds of the subject of the law. curiosity for me. I mean, it was just when I gave similar talk, occasionally people asked me, ah, I think I remember once there was a crystallographer in the audience. And then he said, you forgot the face. And then I said, well, I don't think they are really as insistent. But apparently, uh, with cold neutrons, you can play uh, uh, this uh, game and, and the other experiments. Uh, where you have this gravitationally bound quantum series of matter. Um, I think these are, I mean, uh, Newton's which are gravitationally bound to some, you know, some body. And, uh, but you can study really, it's really the bound space, the quantum mechanical bound space. Now they claim that this is uh, very interesting, the various remains, including foundations of quantum mechanics. Honestly, I have not really started the paper in full detail, but I wanted to give you an answer in case you can Is that for what things and not about me? Well, yeah, well, I mean, uh, that's a very interesting point. Uh, I didn't have, of course, time to go into that. I mean, they, string theory also gives rise to other extended objects, which are brain, they don't have to put them in from the start. They come again uh, from this uh, key duality consideration. That's how I see. But okay, you can also think of them as some solution of the equations that string theory gives rise to, and some of those are like extended objects, like solid and so on. I, I don't think that you can really, I mean, people, for instance, have tried to quantize directly the theory of brains as fundamental objects. And uh, usually they, they have not succeeded. It seems there is something very special to the one dimensional object, object which therefore. Uh, you know, sweeps a two-dimensional surface. I mean, this seems to be a good compromise between working with points, which are very, very singular, and working with objects with more than one dimension, a fundamental object, because then you get again some of the problems of, uh, uh, of the infinities of quantum physics. It's a very roughly speaking, string theory, they use the, the problem of quantization to go of the two dimension of this theory. And two dimension of string theory is much, much uh, less singular than the four dimension. So if you start to increase the dimensionality of this extended object, then you are back into the infinities of conventional quantum theory. 
So it seems that the two dimensions are, are quite true, and one space, one kind of dimension, which is the characteristic of this worksheet of the screen, is the best compromise. It may also have to do, in some deep mathematical sense, with the fact that complex numbers you know, are two dimensions. <laughs> the fact that we can use, actually, use the law to ignore the Very much you showed that the end revised version of the Rothschild view of theory in the light of this theory. So we left the C axis unfaced. Yes, C, yes. Yeah. So why should contrary to the AMC be left unvalidated as the last scheme? Uh, C, the, the, the relativity. Uh, the relativity axis. The and the quantum mechanics axis. Well, well, these are these questions. I mean, uh, they. Uh, um, I mean, they, they, you can you can say always. I mean, I, I always uh, object to the idea of uh, of considering the, the the constancy or the time variation of something which is dimensional. You always have to think in terms of uh, and dimension this quantity. The time of space and time. So I use here C and H bar or the string length as rulers, okay, as units of time and space. And you can always say that those are by definition constant because they are, they are your units. And the question is what other quantities with the same dimension do relative to those? So I always prefer never, you know, not to talk about. Uh, a time dependent C or a time dependent H. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, of course, I need them to be fine. I mean, this is what no, no, I think. I that. mean, the symmetry, what should the invariance in contrary invariance to the function of the function? Oh, oh, oh. Well, that. Yeah. Well, that has actually, it's not even a necessity. Still here, as far as I understand, namely, although the equations are functional invariant, because you put in functional invariant, and even general relativistic invariant, at least as far as we know, uh, the solutions may break this invariant. I mean, when they can point to some direction, you know, they have this non commutative solution. So, I mean, you can, in, in actual Life in natural experiments, you may even look for for those kinds of effects in theory as a result of what we call spontaneous theory. Okay, they believe in a vector, believe essentially. I mean, if you turn on a magnetic field and point in one direction, then of course you know, don't have to worry anymore about the rotation. So, in that sense, now uh, on the other hand, as I say, the theory itself, the action of the Lagrangian, those things, I mean, so far, I mean, you know, we can only construct them in this way, but uh, you know, maybe they are alternatives too. Well, uh, yeah, this is a rather technical comment, and uh, uh, I know that this is the, right? yeah, it seems the case that uh, perturbation theory is perhaps even worse, right, if I remember well, than the quantum theory. I mean, we are accustomed to the version theory, uh, in uh, quantum theory, and it seems that uh, now, the question is whether there is a, a smart way of uh, you know, uh, to, to be summed. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, to Borel resum the series or not. And uh, actually, there is something that 
worries me a little bit more and uh, gives me that in these days, um, in fact, it's literally defined as the turbulent response. And even to put in uh, non perturbative effect, like instant transfers, uh, usually is done by some half screen, half quantum uh, field theory, which is a little bit worrisome. I heard recently I was in Florence for this uh, school workshop that now people may understand how to put uh, instantonic effects, normal effects, completely from a from the screen point of view. And they may even get a new kind of instantonic effect. I'm not asking the school people you can maybe try to sort them out, try to discuss. But I was very impressed by this because I thought it was always a short time. It's clear that we would like to have a non perturbative And uh, for the moment, we move all the way on. But this is also related to the problem of how what this is becoming more Because most of the fields, as to the simulation, we know that the field is not broken for the biology of the different fields. Yeah. Unless we have an offer to but it's for the rest of the field, maybe it's very hard to answer those very important questions. Maybe one more question. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I don't know if that you mean today, but today, which have been already formulated. You see, for instance, we hear quite a lot about a competitor being uh, looked gravity. Now, in my opinion, my modest opinion, look gravity is not revolutionary enough. And I like to compare the look gravity approach to quantizing general relativity to attempts to quantize Fermi's field. Okay, you, I, I'm sure that people try to make uh, sense out of the quantized version but it was just too singular to be singular. And uh, you know, you can change your technique of quantization, but what we learned is that you actually have to change the theory itself. And the theory has to soften at some scale. And uh, it looked to me that the situation is very similar to uh, the gravity. I mean, the theory of gravity is just too singular at high energy. And, uh, and therefore, you have to change it. So I'm a little bit skeptical about uh, the possible success of loop gravity, unless they put, you know, some, some backdoor, some kind of cutoff. It's just a technique to better quantize general relativity. I'm a little bit skeptical about the eventual success. Okay, fair enough. In string theory. Yeah. In, in string cosmology. Well, uh, I think so, in the sense that the, the theory has, well, at least in my own, in the version I like of string theory, it is quite important that. Uh, that you keep the, the cosmological constant uh, uh, small. Um, you see, if the string theory is not supersymmetric, then it suffers deep correction from uh, the cumulative effect. And those, I think, are, can, you know, can spoil the also the features of cosmology. But I think it's even worse. I mean, the, as far as I know, there is no uh, no supersymmetric string theory which is truly really consistent. I may be wrong. I may, I may have forgotten some possibilities. But, uh, again, it's a little bit like with Lawrence environment. The theory, I think, has to be at a deep level supersymmetric. Now, we want to find ways to break spontaneously but not in any 
people's world. For instance, I mean, you know, the, the big mystery of the cosmological constant, of course, the fact is that uh, well, we thought it was zero, you know, it is not zero, but still it's so small that it's a big parcel. Now, in my opinion, supersymmetry should have something to do with the resolution of that puzzle. Uh, now, I, I don't have, of course, an answer to the, uh, to the, to, to the question because the supersymmetry has to be broken and therefore you have to ask the question once the supersymmetry is broken, how big the cosmology is to generate. But while I think there are some chances to, to, to explain the smallness of the cosmological constant with uh, the symmetry without a real we can discuss. Okay, thank you very much. I think that we passed the test. It's time for.